Now that we've built up a little toolkit of skills that will help us to make whatever kinds of little applets we like, it's time to start thinking about how we can control the flow of information throughout our programs. So we're going to look at flow control and the way we do that is by using what I like to call control structures. So far our programs have used a control structure called sequence. Sequence means that everything happens exactly in the order in which it is written. We've also not as a separate control structure but we've also had a look at um, action performed and that is responding to a user generated event. So while our program comes down it might then hit an event it'll jump out of where we're currently at it'll perform everything to do with that event and then once we hit repaint sorry once we hit the line that says repaint it jumps back to exactly where it was in the program and it continues on in its merry little way so everything is still happening in the correct order sometimes in our programming though we might come across a place where we want to make a choice so we get to a point and then we ask a question and if that question is answered in one way, we want to do one piece of code. And if it's answered in another way, we want to execute a different piece of code before then returning to the normal flow of information. Having a branch in our code is usually referred to as putting in an if statement. An if statement asks a true or false question. If the answer is true, it'll execute some code. If it's true, it goes into the statement. If it's false, it skips the statement altogether. If it's true, as I said, it goes into the statement, but then it does actually continue on with the rest of the code as well. We can also have an if statement, which again, asks the true or false question, then it does some stuff if it is true, so this is if it's true, else do some stuff if it is false in the bracket. So if it's true, it goes into the first set of brackets, executes that code, and then once it is finished, it pops out to the closed bracket. If the answer to the question is false, it skips the if and it goes to the else, it executes everything between the open and the close and then it goes out to the close and continues on as usual. Using that first if statement structure where we do something if the answer to a question is true, we might have used that in our applet um, example in components and events where we were accepting user input. We might want to check if the user actually entered a name in that field. So what we might say is if name, so remembering that from action performed we took the name out of the text field and we assigned it to the variable name. We say if name is equal to null, so that's saying if it doesn't have a value, we might give some feedback here in like a g.draw string or something saying please enter some data. Using a completely different scenario for the if-else structure, we might be writing a little applet for a bouncer that's asking whether or not the person is a legal age to enter a nightclub. So we might do something like if age is greater than or equal to 18, we're going to put that as a comment. We're going to tell them to go in. Else, so if they are not 18 or over, we might tell them to go home. There is also a third structure with the if else, and it allows us to ask multiple questions. So we might say, let's say we had a number guessing game. So they're going to guess the number correct, they're going to guess too high or they're going to guess too low. So we might say if 
the guess is equal to the number. We might give some feedback like, yay, you got it right. Else, if the guess was lower than the number, we might say, you've guessed too low. Else, they might have guessed too high. So here we're assuming that if they didn't get it right and they guessed too low, they didn't guess too low, then they must have guessed too high. With this structure, you can have if, else if, else if, else if, else if, as many times as you like. It's not necessarily the neatest solution, but in some ways, or in some cases, it is appropriate to the applet that you're creating. So if you might have noticed with the examples that are provided, when we're writing our true-false question, we are comparing things. And to compare things, we can ask if the two are the same, or are they equal to each other? We can ask if it's less than. So if the item on the left is less than the item on the right, we can ask about greater than. We can ask less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, so including the number. And we can also ask about if it is not equal to. Now when we are comparing um, text, we can't use these operators. We'll need to use, well we can, but there is some additional information that we need to add. But these are the basic comparative operators. As you've seen, you would have seen them in maths as well. So use these in your if statements to form true or false questions. So as I said, this is all about controlling the flow of information through the program. Sequence was that everything goes through, the, through each line of code one by one. And this latest one, if statement, is called selection. It is about allowing you to make a choice and select a path or follow a branch throughout the code. Let's have a look on Eclipse as to how we would actually code these. Okay, in Eclipse here, what I have done is I've taken everything from my events applet and I've copied it and I've pasted it into a new class in a new project. My project is called Control Structures and this class is called If Statements 1. So looking at that first example that we used, we wanted to check if a name was entered. So what we can do is when we draw the, the information on the screen, we need to ask first if name contains a value. So here we can say if name is equal to null, then we want to give an error message that says please enter some data. So in terms of syntax, I put the word if in lowercase. I have an open bracket and over here a close bracket. My true or false question goes in the gap there. Now I've asked if the name does not have a value. If that is true, if it doesn't have a value, I want to give an error message. So I'm going to put g.drawString. Please enter a name. And I'm going to put that just above where my name is being output. Now for it to be a nice error message in terms of attracting attention, we might want to change the color to red. Oop, not a drawstring, set color, color.red because we're using a standard Java color. Now if this error message has ever happened and the color was set to red and it printed my error message, if I don't set it back to black, then the remaining text will also be black. So I'm going to set the color back to, sorry, the color would be red. So I'm going to set it back to 
black there. So what will happen now is the first time I run this, it will tell me, because I haven't yet entered a name, it should tell me that I need to enter a name. Please enter a name, because name is currently equal to null. So once I make my selections, I get some feedback. Oh, sorry. Yes, I get the feedback, but my error message is also gone. Uh, just to quickly show you as well, if I enter a name and then I delete the name, so there is no input, I'm not getting a value, I'm not getting an error message here. And that's because name is not null because it has had a value and that value has now been taken away. But null is a starting thing when it's never had a value. Okay, so we've deleted the name, the name is no longer null, but we need to check whether or not there's no information there. So we might use that else if structure. So we might say else space if and to check if there is any information there we might check the length of the name. So we might say if the name is less than or equal to zero characters long meaning basically that it doesn't have any content, we want to provide that error message. The error is the same, so we'll copy that and paste it down here. So let's have a quick look. Hopefully, I'll just spread that out a little bit so it's easier to read. So I've said if the name has never had a value, print an error message asking them to enter a name. If name has at one point had and a value but it now now no longer has one or it's too short then also provide an error message otherwise this bit of code will happen anyway no matter what whether there are error messages on the screen or not it will always happen because it is not inside one of those statements okay so please enter a name and let's try deleting the name and it's asking us to please fill in a name. Now, it seems kind of silly to provide this feedback if we're waiting for data. So maybe we might say, check if there's been a name. Check if there is still a name. If there are no problems with the name whatsoever, then we would like to do these things. So we're going to pop it in an else. So what this is saying is if there's never been a name, prompt them to enter one. If they pressed enter and there was no content in the text field, give an error message. Otherwise, if the name was all fine and dandy, print this stuff. Let's have a look. So we don't get feedback until we've got data. If we get rid of that data, we get rid of that feedback and we're prompted to give something that is of use. So remembering with an if statement, you have the word if. You ask your question in brackets and you use one of the operators for comparing. Everything that is going to happen if that is true goes inside the curly braces. You can then have an else, which will happen if that question, the answer to that question was false. But you can also ask another question if you want to. Hopefully that's a quick summary for you. Make sure you have a look at um, the practical exercise on my blog and that will go through using these if statements.